Hello and welcome to The Corporate Casket, a semi-weekly series where bad businesses go to die. We will discuss any and everything from bad charities, terrible CEOs, and businesses that have a lot to hide. I'm the Illuminati, and today I'm here to talk about John McAfee. Now, John has been a requested topic for a while now, and he's apparently got a really, really wild life story, some good, some bad. Even though I typically talk about bad businesses and not specific individuals, John seems like he'd make a really good exception, honestly. So let's get right into it and start with who John is, his childhood, and how he rose to fame or infamy, depending on who you ask. So let's get into it. John was born in the UK on September 18th, 1945. His parents moved from Roanoke, Virginia when he was very young. John's father was an alcoholic and committed suicide when John was only 15 years old. At Roanoke College, John also began drinking, but he also made a small fortune selling magazines door to door. Business Insider says that John was a shrewd entrepreneur from an early age. In the 60s, he learned the basics of early computing and landed a job at Missouri Pacific Railroad, where he helped the company use the new IBM computer system to calibrate train schedules. In his personal life, McAfee was using drugs such as LSD and psychedelics. Wired reported that one day he was sold a bag of DMT known as the spirit molecule or a powerful hallucinogenic. He claimed he felt nothing after a line, so he did the entire bag and all hell broke loose and he freaked out, hiding behind a trash can. The computer was splitting train schedules to the moon and nothing made sense. McAfee says that part of him believes he's still on that trip and one day he'll snap out of it and find himself on his couch in St. Louis. Anyway, from there, McAfee moved to Silicon Valley in the 70s, worked at numerous tech companies and eventually sought help and got sober in the 80s. In 1986, the first computer virus hit PCs and McAfee decided to make his own company to fight back. The next year he did exactly that and it didn't take long at all for McAfee's associates to take off. One book about the topic states, writing the program was one stroke of genius. The way McAfee sold the program was another. Instead of retailing his software in a store, McAfee used a technique called shareware. He gave away a version of the program as a free trial, but charged corporations for licenses and technical support if they continued to use it. This was the start of the free trial for antivirus software at the time, and it was massively successful. John McAfee was rich and famous within a few years, and as a result, John also founded the Computer Virus Industry Association and made himself the chairman. Journalists soon began approaching McAfee for his views on the latest computer security threats and what he thought users should do. The first notable horrible advice McAfee gave was in 1992. There was a new virus called Michelangelo that was programmed to lie dormant in machines and wake up on March 6, 1992, when it was supposed to destroy the hard drives that concealed it. When the media approached McAfee for his view, he said that the virus could infect 50,000 to 5 million machines. People latched onto that 5 million figure and naturally people began to panic. But when March 6 rolled around, very few computers were affected and people turned on McAfee, suggesting he made an inaccurate prediction and even did this deliberately to sell his software. When McAfee reported a huge increase in business around the time, the critics believed their suspicions were confirmed. Whether it's related or not, you decide, but McAfee resigned from McAfee Associates two years later in 1994 when he was 48 years old. The company went public and McAfee moved to Colorado. Here's the thing, I don't know if I think this was intentional or not. Even though it sure as hell seems like McAfee benefited from telling people the dangerous Michelangelo virus would become and you know destroy all these hard drives and stuff, computers were still a gigantic unknown at that time. After all, the whole Y2K thing happened eight years after this event, when people still believed that computers were gonna get shut down at the turn of the millennia and millions of dollars were spent for preparation. No major malfunctions were reported, but financial institutions were genuinely concerned at any time that it could happen. But did anything happen? Not really. So I can't with 100% certainty say that John was blowing things out of proportion intentionally. Regardless, after some time, as the internet began to grow, McAfee saw a new opportunity. Powwow was an online community that was supposed to compete with IMs from AOL and Yahoo Instant Messaging. 
1994, social software was still relatively unexplored. And between 1994 and 2000, about 8 million people joined Pow Wow and set up tribes, the term McAfee used for interest groups. However, AOL and Yahoo dominated and put Pow Wow out of business by 2001. Its lifespan was pretty short. McAfee started to opt for a quieter life after that. And in 2005, media reports suggested he was auctioning land for development. He became a major investor in Zone Labs, but by 2007, the money was running out and the crash of 2008 hit him quite hard. McAfee was still a millionaire, but instead of the 100 plus million that he had made, McAfee had only about 4 million left. That's still way more than most people, but the point is like, he wasn't exactly a frugal guy either. Like, hey, it's your money, do what you want with it. And for McAfee, that was mansions and jets and eventually yet another company that sold herbal antibiotics. McAfee's specialty had been computers. Sure, he got into yoga and there's nothing wrong with that. I've got no issues with a millionaire starting a yoga studio that talks about breathing your stress away and being Zen. I think it would be a lot easier for most people to do that with his kind of bank account anyway, but I'm not judging you do what you want with your money, obviously. However, herbal antibiotics made without regulations in Brazil, well, that's a little ridiculous. Some kind of line has to be drawn and we'll get to that in just a bit. One source explained that this wasn't the only issue McAfee had at the time though. He was into arrow trekking as well and neither were exactly working out for him. Aero trekking, by the way, is just flying a lightweight plane at low altitudes, but it's known to be dangerous. It reads, to give aero trekking an illusion of momentum, McAfee set up a network of fake websites purportedly from aero trekking clubs scattered around the country. And at the end of my visit, McAfee told me proudly of his scheme to distract nearby residents who had become irritated by the aero trekking and begin to organize against the company. One of the Sky Gypsies had snuck into the local post office after hours and posted a flyer announcing a national paintball convention coming to town. The flyer promised hundreds of trigger happy shooters and camouflage would soon descend en masse and storm through the wilderness. To bolster the hoax, McAfee had set up a fake website promoting the event. The homebrew psyops campaign went off without a hitch. By the next day, the town was a beehive of angry protesters and the arrow trekking issue was forgotten. In retrospect, it's startling that McAfee was so committed to aero trekking. The year before, his own nephew had even been killed in a crash along with the passenger that he had been carrying. The passenger's family hired a lawyer and filed a $5 million lawsuit. McAfee started telling reporters that the financial crisis had all but wiped him out, slashing his net worth to 4 million. Both the New York Times and CNN reported the claim, which he later characterized to me as not very accurate at all. He unloaded all his real estate at fire sale prices and moved to Belize, having been advised by his lawyers that a judgment in the States is not valid there. He obtained residency far more quickly than the one year minimum waiting time mandated by law. This is a third world country, he told me later. So I had to bribe a whole bunch of folks. This got incredibly strange really quick and it's only about to get worse. And for the record, uh, that was one gigantic quote. So I know some people do not uh, approve of the word gypsy and that is exactly what it's called. And it's in capitals, Sky Gypsy. So I am assuming this is a name and that is why that is said that way in the quote. But back to Belize. McAfee claimed that a judgment from the United States is not valid in Belize and lawsuits in process in the US would have a difficult time in the collection stage. In other words, he was trying to play the system. Yet I think what amazes me more is that he's called the lawsuits frivolous. Like someone died at his hand while arrow trekking, but that's a frivolous lawsuit apparently. I do believe that McAfee wasted a lot of his money and he was scrambling to do anything to get it back, whether it was air trekking or these antibiotics as we're about to discuss. But it also seems like he just liquidated as much as possible to escape the law and those seeking justice for what he'd done. As this source continues, Accompanied by a gaggle of hanger-ons, including Erwin by then 28, McAfee settled into a beachside compound on Ambergris K in Belize. With characteristic gusto, he launched a slew of enterprises, including a coffee shop and a high-speed ferry service. Then he met an attractive 31-year-old named Allison Adonisio, a vacationing Harvard biologist. She told him she was working in a new field of microbiology called antiquorum sensing. Instead of killing infectious bacteria, she said, certain chemicals can disrupt and neutralize them. She'd already identified one rainforest plant that was rich in such compounds and believed there must be many more. 
They could solve the burgeoning global problem of antibiotic resistance, she said. McAfee offered to build her a lab in Belize where she could work with native plants. She flew home, quit her job, and moved down to the jungle. McAfee's next big thing was underway. He bought land along the New River, deep in the interior of the country, where he and Adonizio would grow the herbs. He also acquired another parcel a few miles downriver near the town of Orange Walk, where he started building a processing facility. He announced that she had identified six promising new herbs and invited me down to take a look. This, he said, was the reason he'd come to Belize in the first place, to rid humanity of disease and at the same time to lift Belizeans up from poverty. I'm 65 years old, he said. It's time to think about what kind of legacy I'm going to leave behind. It really does feel like John went from zero to 100 real quick. If he still thought he was on a bad trip, he was wrong though, but this was reality. It seems like the sudden loss of wealth from the recession hit him hard and the partying, no responsibility attitude of his wasn't doing him any favors. McAfee has since claimed that he even believes the passenger that died while they were era trekking, 61-year-old Robert Gilson, must have had a stroke or heart attack and fallen into the wires of the kite's wing. McAfee says that to honor his nephew, Joel, he got a single teardrop added below his Sky Gypsies tattoo. Whether or not this was user error or some horrific incident, I'm not sure. But the fact that McAfee seems to shrug it off and say aero trekking can create an avenue for self-awareness only seven months after their death when he's not self-aware enough to face the consequences of his action is a little bit mind boggling to me. Seriously, I spent so much time during this research just trying to understand how he went from making some bad investments to running off to Belize to escape lawsuits and acting blase about the two deaths. And it still baffles me. John was found liable though, eventually. One article about this states, a civil court judge in Maricopa County, Arizona, found that McAfee was liable for the death of Robert Gilson, who died when the ultralight he was flying in crashed into a remote canyon in 2006. After Gilson's heirs filed a wrongful death lawsuit against him, McAfee reportedly sold all his US holdings and moved to Belize, where he said his lawyers had advised him that a judgment in the States is not valid. In 2014, when this was finally dealt with, the judge ordered about two and a half million dollars to be paid to the family for Gibson's wrongful death. I'm sure that no amount is going to be enough though, and it doesn't bring back Robert. And I don't doubt that his wife and family would rather have a few more years with him than the money, but I don't doubt that this was at least something, something is better than nothing, and it was some accountability on McAfee's part, even if he was unwilling to take it. However, as absolutely ridiculous and heartbreaking as all of this has been so far, this is only the tip of the iceberg. While in Belize, McAfee's neighbor was killed and many, many believe that McAfee himself was responsible. There's even a documentary about this called Gringo, which is on Hulu, that I decided to watch for some more information. Now, before anyone decides to jump down my throat, I know that some people believe that this is not uh, well sourced enough to be considered or that it's gonna be considered biased. Others seem to say that it's accurate and a good source of information and it's even won a couple awards. Regardless of what you do believe, I wanted to watch it because it's a huge part of McAfee's story. And either way, I'm going to be looking at a variety of sources across the board to just help show you a variety of different statements of things being said, different points of view, so that it can help you build your own conclusive opinion on what happened. As for now, let's get into what Gringo has to say. First of all, I adore how it opens and let me get that out of the way first. It starts with John being pulled over for what looks like a traffic stop. The guy that pulls him over doesn't know who he is. And John says, I'm John McAfee, the FBI wants me. I'm wanted for murder in Belize and I fled to Guatemala. He threw himself completely under the bus and I don't even know what to make of it, but it definitely made me laugh. As for the documentary itself, John refused to be interviewed, yet he didn't refuse in the normal route either. When someone refuses to be interviewed, you'd expect him to say, no, do not contact me again. Instead, John said, do not contact me, and then repeatedly emailed the documentarian saying, do not imply that I refuse to be interviewed, you will not get an interview. So he's refusing to be interviewed, but, doesn't want it to be implied that he said no to an interview. And that's just not how it works. Especially considering that he later not only answers questions via email, but says some pretty damning things as well. Like when he states that he didn't lose his money, but he spread those rumors in the hopes that the lawsuits would stop chasing him. Anyway, Nanette Bernstein, the documentarian, interviews quite a few people in Belize to see what their take is. And some state that everyone knew John McAfee. 
He bought property, he brought his friends from the States. The area got a lot of tourism because of John. He was donating to the police department, weapons, handcuffs, batons, tasers, which is all very generous. He gave a boat to the Coast Guard, which John states was out of gratefulness since he became a permanent resident there. I don't wanna doubt, honestly, my goal isn't to find something wrong with every single one of John's actions. Good people are capable of making mistakes just as bad people are capable of doing a good deed. To me, it seems like John was simply using all of those liquidated funds to make donations and make some new friends. I have no idea if this is a sign of anything being premeditated here, and I've got to be really careful and walk on thin ice here because things are still alleged. The point is, John had some friends in the police, and since he himself said that he had to bribe people, well, it does read as a little suspicious. Although McAfee refused to be interviewed, even though he doesn't want anyone to call it that, Allison was in the documentary, the microbiologist who he hired to make a business out of vitamins with him. According to her, she was uncomfortable being with him in Belize because of all the large, heavily armed guards that McAfee had at his place. At one point in the documentary, she states, I'm sorry to go off on a tangent. There's so much crazy shit, I don't even know where to start. In Belize, many people told Nanette what a fantastic guy John had been. He finished their house, paid for their light and water, gave carpenters work and the like. Yet, as Allison said, there was that crazy shit happening below the surface. Some people refused to speak to Nanette because they seemed scared of John. One man said, he was very secretive. He knows everything going on. I don't want to betray him. Apparently, John would have Allison put dye into bottles to make their labs seem legitimate. So that, judging by the photos alone, there was nothing more to show aside from just some random plants in the Belize jungle. She told John that it seemed dishonest, but John said it was just business, just a way to get investors. John would tell investors that they were doing incredible research, yet Allison herself says that wasn't the case and it was all a facade. John began to get more and more paranoid as time went on too. Living in Belize as a very wealthy man, John was a target, getting calls saying, watch yourself gringo and the like. He hired more and more bodyguards, one named Tino Allen, who had been sent to prison 22 times and John liked to brag about it. I'm not saying you shouldn't hire someone that's been to prison, but John was giving people with serious criminal records and offenses, weapons, guns, vehicles, and as one person said, making them feel like it wasn't Belize anymore. It was McAfee world. Another resident, Dean Estrada, said he linked up with the worst gangs in the area to control Carmelita, a village in Belize. One of these was called George Street, and he was surrounding himself with these people. But John just said these people were badass. He wanted to create a culture or mystique around himself, not realizing the danger he was creating. John had his bodyguards in camouflage uniforms with sunglasses. They all looked like actual soldiers. He had 12 at all times, even when he went into town and people were terrified of him. This was a recipe for disaster. And for the record, this documentary wasn't the only source to state this either. Wired, Business Insider, and the New York Times all make mention of John having connections with Belizean drug gangs. And again, I'm not saying you can't or shouldn't hire former convicts. Everyone deserves a second chance, right? But these people in particular were not really reformed at all by the sounds of it. And John was placing guns in their hands and essentially enabling terrifying behavior. John didn't just want bodyguards. He wanted control of Camerlita. John opened up a so-called police station, but for his own police force. He wanted the bodyguards he had to run the place. They stopped people in the streets late at night and made death threats, setting a curfew on Carmelita, taking his paranoia from concerning to outrageous. One source says, Carmelita had no police station, so McAfee bought a small cement house and hired workers to install floor to ceiling iron bars. He then told the national cops responsible for the area to start arresting people. The police protested that they were ill-equipped for the job, so McAfee furnished them with imported M16s, boots, pepper spray, stun guns, and batons. Eventually, he started paying officers to patrol during their off hours. The police, in essence, became McAfee's private army, and he began issuing orders. What I'd like you to do is to go into Carmelita and start getting information for me, he told the officers on his payroll. Who's dealing drugs and where are the drugs coming from? When a 22-year-old villager named Berger fired a gun outside Emschweiler on the villager's house in November, 2011, McAfee decided he couldn't rely on others to get the work done. He needed to take action himself. An eyewitness told him that Berger had shot a motorcycle. It looked like a drug deal gone bad. 
Berger's sister said he was firing at stray dogs that attacked him. Either way, McAfee was incensed. He drove his gray Dodge pickup to the family's wooden shack near the river, strode into the muddy yard near M. Schweiler as his backup. She was carrying a matte black air rifle with a large scope. Berger wasn't there, but his mother, sister, and brother-in-law were. I'm giving you a last chance here, McAfee said, holding his Smith and Wesson. Your brother will be a dead man if he doesn't turn in that gun. It doesn't matter where he goes. It was like he thought he was in a movie, says Amelia Allen, the shooter's sister, but she wasn't going to argue with McAfee. Her mother pulled the gun out of a bush and handed it to him. McAfee was like a dictator of Carmelita, his bodyguards, the police, and his word law. At least that's the picture the documentary paints. McAfee didn't even refer to his security guards as security guards after a time. According to Allison, he called them hitmen. In the documentary, she recalls her own story about a few days before she left Belize and how dangerous John was. I want to put a trigger warning here that there will be mentions of sexual assault and it, this is, it's gonna be bad. If you're not in the headspace to listen, it'll only take a couple minutes. Feel free to skip ahead, maybe five minutes and then come back. Um, but if you can't handle it, then just skip this part. I'll preface this by saying that these are still alleged, but given what McAfee has already done, the power trip that he's on and what's to come, I'd say that they're quite credible and I see no reason why Allison would lie about this. Here's what she says. I told him I wanted to go home and I had a headache from crying. John brought me a couple pills and a glass of orange juice. It tasted bitter and foul. I remember making a joke about not letting good orange juice in a better place called Orange Walk and the rest of the night was flashes. He was standing over me naked. I woke up the next morning dry heaving. I put on my clothes. I didn't even remember taking them off. I was crying and I was bleeding. Somehow I found the courage to confront him and he acted as if nothing happened. I said I was leaving. I started a calm conversation and he went zero to crazy in like two seconds. He called me all kinds of names and pushed me out the door. I locked myself in the lab and I started destroying all the samples. I emailed my dad about a plane ticket home. And as soon as I hit send, he cut the power. He cut the email and he cut the power and he left and he got a gun and he came back. I'd made some friends by that point and I texted my friends. My friends came and got me and they escorted me out and hid me and took me to the plane the next morning. When I got home, I told the FBI what happened to me. Unfortunately, they have no jurisdiction, so nothing could be done. John is a perfect example of how money and power can bring out the absolute worst in people. Not only was it money and power, but others say he wasn't sober at all and drugs fueled McAfee as well. One 2016 Intelligencer article from Jeff Wise reads, just last week, I got my answer. A former member of his inner circle forwarded me a photo of a packaging label that one of McAfee's friends took in the course of a four day binge earlier this month in New York City. Hi, Casper. Oh, bye, Casper. The label from a package delivered from a Chinese chemical company suggests why McAfee never called the drug by name. The moniker, and this one is a doozy, is phenylpyrolidinol hexanone. hardly rolls trippingly off the tongue. The chemical compound has no street name, although among organic chemists, it goes by a slightly catchier handle of alpha PHP. This chemical belongs to a group called the cathinone class, all of which are similar in structure and function to the active ingredient in cat. The molecular structure tends to block the reuptake of dopamine in the brain, which leads to the excited delirium, says Jim Hall, an epidemiologist at the Center for Applied Research on Substance Use and Health Disparities at Nova Southeastern University in Florida. Structurally, the alpha PHP molecule is extremely close to the better known drug alpha PVP or Flocka, which is known for refueling sexual appetite, hallucinations, and paranoia in binges that can go on for days. People will imagine that they're being chased by wild animals, Hall says. Many users express dislike for it sharply. It's very linked to cognitive impairment and high paranoia that lasts for days after the desired effects wear off. However, it's extremely compulsive and addictive. So people who didn't like it still seek the high stimulant effects and euphoric feelings they get from it. Based on laboratory tests of chemical reactivity, alpha PHP might be more potent than alpha PVP in the brain, says Michael H. Bauman, a chemist in the designer drug research unit of the National Institute on Drug Abuse. 
McAfee described some of his intensely vivid paranoid fantasies to Davis, a writer for Wired, during his 2012 visit. McAfee told him that he'd been walking along a beach one night when the gang suppression unit in elite Belizean police squad began pursuing him in golf carts. He hid on a balcony, but the officers followed and silently surrounded him in the darkness. Two of them were less than three feet away, McAfee told Davis. They stood unmoving. No one said a word all night long. They just surround you and stand still. Think about it. It's freaky shit, sir. Finally, McAfee claimed the cops backed away and melted into the night. I'm not saying this excuses McAfee at all. His actions are still his own and McAfee should be held accountable. He took the drugs, therefore he's responsible for what he does on them. But at least this may explain what the hell was going on in his mind. John even claimed that 11 times in one year, people tried to kidnap him and there were attempts on his life. He even paid gang members $3,000 to beat a man that he believed was going to harm and rob him, a man named David Middleton. However, According to a different Carmelita resident, David was a cool guy that made no problems. Most of the time when you saw him, he was with his kid, this man said. Yet out of paranoia or intel that this man truly did intend to rob him, McAfee sent people after him. The driver was interviewed for this documentary and said, I was there. His whole face, full torture, steak knife, cut him up. All of us had tasers, taser him in the mouth, in the face. Then they take down his pants and they push it on his private parts. The guy was screaming for his life, real screaming, bawling. Then they called McAfee. McAfee apparently wanted to talk to the guy personally to make his point, don't fuck with me. When they brought David back to the village, they pushed him out of one of McAfee's trucks in front of the people of Carmelita. The point had been made, don't fuck with me. I know that some people may say, well, there's no proof this happened. That's true. There's no proof McAfee was involved. Some may not believe it, and some people may not want to speak ill of McAfee considering that he helped them when he first arrived in Belize. And yet multiple people were interviewed for this documentary. Many residents in Carmelita and those that were willing to speak out all said the same thing. McAfee was a dictator there, and it wouldn't surprise me in the slightest if it were true. The documentary states that it's because David knew better than to call McAfee out for his actions as worse would be done to him. But tragically, the worst had been done. David Middleton slipped into a coma and passed away. I found an old Belize news source that reported on this and it stated that, Orange Walk police are investigating the murder of David Middleton, who was abducted, beaten, and stabbed on Monday. Before he slipped into a coma, Middleton told police that he had been abducted, beaten, and stabbed by two men who came to his house in Orange Walk. He says he did not know either of the men who drove a white pickup truck. He died on Friday at the KHMH and is now a murder investigation. I really do believe McAfee knew something, especially if he had a freaking talk to David. He must've seen how hurt David was. One may argue, oh, he just wanted David to learn a lesson. He wasn't trying to kill him, but it doesn't matter. McAfee allegedly hired three men to beat him. He didn't just want justice. He wanted David to suffer horribly, and that's exactly what happened. One man, Eddie McCoy, said that McAfee knew David and I were close. He wanted to get rid of me. He thought I was going to kill him. Eddie McCoy said he wanted to get rid of John before he got rid of me. Eddie was dangerous. He didn't fear the police because his brother was military. He was a gang member known as Mac-10 because of the gun he used. Eddie claimed that he had a talk with John. They sat down and made a truce, and Eddie began working with John. Remember Eddie. He's going to be important later, okay? But for now, there's yet another crime we have to discuss, what McAfee did with women. Again, I can only say that these things are alleged, but the evidence stacks up. See, John told Nanette over email that she wasn't speaking with private citizens during this documentary, but the Belizean government. I don't see why the government would make up these lies against John, but even if that were true, it doesn't explain what women have said about John. At around the 47 minute mark, John told a different interviewer, not Nanette, but a different one, that he had many teenage girlfriends at one time. They were above the age of consent, but yes, he had teenage girlfriends. And look, just because something isn't illegal doesn't really make it okay either. He's taking advantage of young women in vulnerable situations. And let's be honest here. Do we think that these teenagers, actual teenagers, would be sleeping with John if he were broke? The age of consent in Belize is only 16 years old. So if John, by his own admission, was sleeping with teenagers, I mean, the power dynamic and the large age gap, it just really all rubs me the wrong way. 
he can say it's legal all he wants, but his own masseuse said that five or six girls lived in the house. One woman that was sleeping with John said, yes, it was for money. She got $900 per day when she was with him and she needed the money for her child. Another woman, Samantha, says she started dating him when she was 18. One young woman said John gave her money for school and she slept with him in exchange. And each of the three girls interviewed for the documentary said, John treated me the best. He would tell them they're beautiful, all the stuff they wanted to hear. They were there for the money at first, but John's masseuse said that after a while, they did have true feelings for him as they were never treated like that before. But here's the thing, and here's what changes everything. Everything you just heard, forget it. While I was watching this documentary, I was bothered by the fact that John was sleeping with and seemingly taking advantage of these vulnerable positions that these women were in, right? Like that's where my mindset was at. We're all on the same page, right? I want you to know the headspace I was in when this bombshell was dropped. Because, well, um, apparently the women claim that the only sex John wanted was scat sex. Um, they say that John wanted them to sit on a hammock with a hole cut out of it. And as they say, shit into his mouth. So I guess John wasn't, uh, I guess having sex with them in the traditional way, I suppose. I mean, I, I'm really not trying to kink shame here, right? Like I'm really trying not to. The point is these girls are still young. They are still, you know, not considered adults because they're not 18 and they are shitting in his mouth from a hammock. I'm not 100% sure what to say about this. So um, I'm just gonna leave it at that. Hammock shitting mouth man. So to cleanse the palate before we continue on, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and make this real awkward moment here to put in today's sponsors. Thanks for sponsoring an episode, including a shitting man hammock situation. Uh, The real MVP. Okay, so recently I've come across a new problem just in my personal life. Like I have this weird need to just decompress now and just listen to music or watch TikToks just for hours on end. But I like to be comfy, like sitting on a couch or something like that. But I also don't wanna annoy people with my music or whatever I'm listening to. And so I've just started popping in my Raycons at home where I'm just vegging on the couch, doing that kind of decompressing thing. And honestly, it's been working a lot better for me. I had my you know, extrovert moment, now I gotta have my introvert moment. And I'm happy that Raycon can transition with me from being loud and obnoxious and outdoorsy and friendly to wanting to be inside, reserved, quiet, and just kind of have some time to myself. And that might be something a lot of you will appreciate too, as a nice pair of wireless earbuds in your ears that can make all the difference. And you'll get crisp, powerful beats at half the price of other premium audio brands. And Raycons look great and feel even better. And they come in a range of cool colors, despite the fact that I have always chosen the black pair like a boring person. I just, I just, I can't help it. But they have a ton of cool colors if that's your thing too. So if you wanna get started with some Raycons, they're offering 15% off all their products for my listeners. And here's what you gotta do to get it. Just go to buyraycon.com slash casket. There you'll get 15% off your entire Raycon order. And it's such a good deal. You'll want to grab a pair and a spare. That's 15% off at buyraycon.com slash casket. Buyraycon.com slash casket. Today's episode is also sponsored by Stitch Fix. Shopping for clothes can be a daunting challenge. You'll never know if things will fit, returns are difficult, and maybe you don't even wanna go into the stores anymore. But this season, let Stitch Fix do all the hard work for you. Stitch Fix offers clothing hand-selected by expert stylists for your unique size, style, and budget. And every piece is chosen for your fit and your life, and it's the easy solution to finding what makes you look and feel your best. And they've got fits for women, men, and children. And it's super easy. It just costs $20 for a styling fee for each box. They ship you your goodies to your door. You try on what you like, return what you don't like, keep what you do, and they only charge you for the pieces that don't return to them. And there's no subscription required with this. You can just try it once and just, you know, ask for a box whenever you need it, or you can get automatic deliveries. It's whatever you're feeling. So if you want to get started today, make sure to go to stitchfix.com slash casket, and you'll get 25% off when you keep everything in your fix. Again, that's stitchfix.com slash casket for 25% off off when you keep everything in your fix. Stitchfix.com slash casket. All right, so moving on. Uh, it's time to get into the real shit of it all. Sorry, I, I'm, still, I'm still scarred. But the point is here, McAfee had created an environment of fear. No one wanted to talk to him. People would literally rather die than reveal they had any type of beef against McAfee. Well, everything changed again on April 30th, 2012. 
Tino Allen, John's security guard, the one that went to prison 22 times, if you'll recall, said that he woke up to the dogs barking at around 5 or 5.30 in the morning. He said the police were at the gate. There were 42 soldiers coming down the driveway with automatic weapons. The GSU or Gang Suppression Unit are a sort of specialist group of police officers who, as one man puts it, pride themselves on being incorruptible. They're not like the police, the men said. They allegedly killed one of the guard dogs, then handcuffed and searched for McAfee because intelligence at the time suggested that he was offering a mass amount of narcotics. He wasn't charged with this though, even though there were blocks of what appeared to be cocaine at his compound. When they were tested, the properties weren't of any hard drugs and he wouldn't be put in jail or anything. McAfee said he was victimized because he didn't give money to a politician that asked for a donation and it took interference from a US embassy to get him out. So naturally this made John even more paranoid. He left Orange Walk and moved to San Pedro with even more fear and frustration than before. This is when he started telling more and more stories, soldiers coming out of the sea to try and get him absolutely wild tales. McAfee gained a reputation in the neighborhood and not a good one either. After all, he was wandering around the beach with multiple armed guards and women on his arm. People felt like they were being terrorized, both locals and tourists. There were complaints about his noisy guard dogs and many locals in San Pedro said he was generous, but unstable. Generally, you don't need a bodyguard in Belize, said George Alana, a San Pedro Sun reporter who interviewed McAfee several times, noting top elected officials don't have them. It does call attention when you move with so many guards. McAfee's home is in a stretch of ambergris where the wealthiest foreigners hole up. Raw lots of land 100 feet by 200 feet can cause up to $500,000 there. Even modest looking houses reflect multi-million dollar investments. One man that wasn't particularly fond of McAfee, hell, he was even vocal about disliking him, was Gregory Fowl, his neighbor. Greg lived about 600 feet south of McAfee on the beach. He had been in construction and retired, intending to help out there and there and work on some of the homes in Belize. However, when he was on the beach, there was McAfee with several armed guards and large vicious dogs. Greg tried to talk to McAfee about the guard dogs, but McAfee would get his gun and demand Greg get off his property instead. Even though there were police reports against him, even though the mayor himself spoke to John, McAfee didn't listen. So in retaliation, Greg poisoned McAfee's dogs. And I wanna say that I don't condone Greg's actions here. I understand it's out of frustration, but poisoning an innocent animal is fucked up and that's never a way to resolve anything. I know he probably felt, I don't know, like a helpless millionaire in Belize because you know this was going on and no one was doing anything about the vicious dogs roaming around on the beaches, but this wasn't the way to handle it, not at all especially not when that someone was John McAfee. John kept saying, I'm gonna kill his ass. He was so furious with Greg. Saturday morning, the dogs were buried and at about 10 or 11 that night, Gregory Fowl was coming home. He texted a friend and said, there's someone in my yard. And the next day, Sunday morning, he was found dead by his housekeeper. He had been shot in the head from close range. There was no sign of a burglary. It was personal. ABC News wrote on November 14th, 2012, Gregory Fowl, who was found shot to death in Belize Sunday, had confronted tech guru John McAfee about his vicious dogs and had joined other neighbors in filing a complaint with local officials demanding they do something about his dogs and the armed and aggressive security guards patrolling his beachfront property. McAfee, who is being sought for questioning in Fowl's murder, has been on the run since the weekend, though he is not believed to have left Belize. He denies shooting Fowl, claiming that he is not well-liked by Belizean Prime Minister Dean Barrow and that Belize officials want him dead. On Wednesday, Prime Minister Dean Barrow said McAfee was bonkers and needed to man up and talk to police. ABC News has obtained an exclusive copy of the complaint against McAfee, which Fowl wrote on behalf of the neighborhood and filed with local officials last month. The residents and visitors of Mata Grande subdivision and surrounding properties petition local authorities to address three issues affecting our safety, health, and tourism, says the complaint. These problems are all at the residence of John McAfee. The petition charges that security guards on McAfee's property walk around with shotguns at night and up and down the beach. They have been known to shine spotlights right into people's eyes at night and act aggressively with their guns, chambering a bullet in nonsense such as this. People are scared to walk down the beach at night as a result. The tourists are terrified. The complaint also alleges that taxis and delivery trucks arrive at McAfee's house at all hours and that vicious dogs on his property are running amok. These animals get loose and run as a pack. Three residents have been bitten and three tourists have been attacked. 
According to the complaint, when one of McAfee's dogs attacked a young female tourist, a neighbor who had witnessed the attack confronted McAfee, who had also witnessed the attack. McAfee did nothing about it, says the complaint. Neighbors told ABC News that Fowl, who lived 300 yards from McAfee, who was the person who confronted McAfee. McAfee, who had kept in touch with a Wired editor, Joshua Davis, while in hiding, said today he had radically altered his appearance in order to elude the local police. I have modified my appearance in a radical fashion, McAfee told Davis. I'll probably look like a murderer, unfortunately. McAfee, 67, said he had dyed his hair, beard, mustache, and eyebrows black. Again, not saying poisoning his dogs was the way to go about this, and I love dogs. I can't imagine ever doing that to a dog, even if a dog is aggressive but I kind of sympathize. Like it sounds like chaos was absolutely ensuing, but again, I don't think poisoning dogs is the right answer either. And again, this is all alleged that McAfee is responsible. He certainly had the motive to do this. There were also taser marks all over Greg's body, which certainly seemed to be McAfee's MO as that's what also happened to David Middleton too. John was on the run for a little while. One reporter said that John McAfee was a horrible disguiser, pretending to be a crippled old man with powder in his hair and a cane. When asked directly if he killed Greg Fall though, he didn't say no. And that's something that I found quite odd, honestly. He didn't say, no, I didn't kill him. Like if I were accused of killing someone, that's exactly what I would say. I'd be like, absolutely not. I'd say, no, I didn't. And John McAfee just said, I barely knew him. Why would I kill him? I just thought that it was kind of worth mentioning because it stood out to me as just being very inconsistent with someone who is supposedly innocent. Anyway, John escaped to Guatemala and Vice TV followed him. They even took a photo with him, but the GPS location was on. Now he was in trouble with Guatemala for entering the country illegally, so the jig was up for John. Belize tried to have him extradited, and when John realized they were trying to deport him and his lawyer couldn't file an appeal in time, he faked a heart attack. And yeah, I'm serious, that's how all over the place this case gets. One CNN article at the time read, Guatemalan authorities took him into custody on accusations of entering the country illegally, and his asylum bid was rejected. McAfee then waged a public battle requesting asylum and arguing that police in Belize were after him following his apparent decision to shed light on corruption in the country. He also said the breach resulted in Belize soldiers shooting his dog. CNN cannot independently verify his account. He opted to return to his country of origin, said attorney Telesforo Guerra, who has represented McAfee since he arrived in Guatemala last week. On Sunday, McAfee told reporters that he hoped to go back to the United States. Our intent is to return to America if at all possible and settle down to whatever normal life we can settle down to under the circumstances, he said. There is no hope for my life if I am ever returned to Belize. Authorities in Belize, where McAfee had lived since 2008, say they wanna talk to him about Fall's death. And here's the thing. I understand that McAfee has stated he doesn't want to face the justice system in Belize, but if you don't wanna face it, then like, maybe don't commit the crimes. Like, I I don't know enough about the justice system there and how it works, but at the very least, there's evidence he terrorized citizens there. In my opinion, this is just John not wanting to face the consequences of his actions and nothing more. This faked heart attack is fucking ridiculous. He waited until 3 p.m. when his lawyer was able to file an appeal and then said, I feel better and I want to go back to my cell, thank you. Once the appeal was filed, that meant it would be years before he could even be deported and the Guatemalan police didn't want him in their custody that long. So John got what he wanted. He was deported to the States. Even McAfee said he acted like a madman and it worked. I just can't help but feel extremely frustrated because Art Fall, Greg's father, was left without answers and his son's death is overshadowed with all the headlines of madman millionaire running from police. The Belize police are looking at forensic evidence, but they don't have a DNA lab or the level of forensic expertise to prosecute a crime in that way. The murder conviction rate is abysmally low, around 3%, and crime rate is high with about 40 homicides per 100,000 citizens. So prosecuting John, then they don't have the technology, and now he's in another country, it just doesn't seem likely. Even the police say it's confession and eyewitnesses alone do this. However, there's still evidence against John. One man, Cassian, also known as Cash, was the one who put money in people's bank accounts, like John's accountant. He says that the morning after the dogs were poisoned, John told him to put $5,000 into someone's account, Eddie Mack's account. 
Remember how I said, remember Eddie McCoy, also known as Mac? Yeah, this Eddie, the one that had been friends with David, but made a truce with John later on. Well, Cash picked Eddie up at around three or four in the morning, a couple days after the dogs died, the night that Greg was killed. Both Cash, as well as one of the women staying at the house said they believe Mac 10, Eddie Mac was responsible and had been paid off to do it. And yet the police never even questioned Cash about the crime, not even a single question, he says. When Nanette asks Eddie more about these allegations about Greg Fall, he claims nothing happened and he's also smiling and chuckling uncomfortably. It's incredibly suspicious. And yet McAfee loved the spotlight. In 2013, he posted a YouTube video entitled How to Uninstall McAfee from Your Computer, badmouthing the company that bears his name, which at the time was owned by Intel, according to Reuters. The video, which surfaced last week, shows him complaining about the difficulties of removing McAfee antivirus software from computers and reading what he claims are letters of complaint from those who have used it. He says that the software was beautiful before it fell out of his hands. In the video, McAfee uses a lot of vulgar language, purports to snort a powder and fire a gun into a computer and is undressed and pawed by a group of young women. He says he did it all to mock the media's unfair portrayal of him as a madman. I did the best I could at a paranoid rant, he said in a telephone interview on Wednesday. He tried out business again with a company called Future Tense Central and an app known as Cognizant, but what he's more known for at this point, what even more infamous for, is actually attempting to run for president as part of the Libertarian Party. I I don't know if anyone remembers that. It feels like it's been so long ago and politics has become so painful to get through that it just, it feels like this is, you know, eons ago. But about 50 minutes into the documentary, he said he was called the Donald Trump of Belize. And at first thought, you know, surely it's not that bad, right? But yeah, seriously, the name kind of does suit him. John acts outrageous for attention. He said that secret cameras are hidden in cactuses. There's no privacy anymore, all while the investigation for the case continued. Belize investigators told police that they believed Eddie was responsible, but then Eddie fled the country. Nanette tried to speak with John, but he called her Satan and told her she was his final battle that he couldn't lose. Thankfully, John didn't win the primary of the Libertarian Party, but he's still, as Nanette says, a major player in the cybersecurity world. When he was announced CEO of MGT Capital Investments, the stock rose over 700%. Frankly, I personally believe he does so well selling cybersecurity because he's so paranoid. Who better to sell you on security than someone as paranoid as John, right? Now it's like he's looped all the way around. They think he's a security genius and he started to regain his good reputation and it's incredible in a messed up way. I don't know how else to put it. Incredible in the worst possible sense of the word, how people don't seem to know the Brazil story and believe that he's still a security mogul. However, though this is where the documentary ends, this is not at all where the story ends. In 2018, McAfee left MGT. He tried to run for president in 2020 as a libertarian again, but we all know that that didn't work out. He wasn't nominated and around that time, he had said that taxes are illegal and he hadn't filed a return in eight years. Again, this guy just loves throwing himself under the bus if it means attention. There's been DUI charges too, but most notably, he was sued for the murder of Greg Fall. The San Pedro Sun in 2018 wrote, with the investigations in Belize at a standstill, Fall's family brought up a civil case against McAfee. The court will enter default judgment as to liability in favor of plaintiff and against defendant for the wrongful death of Gregory V. Fall, said a US district judge, Gregory Parisnell. Further information has revealed that McAfee never made himself present during this court process. It took years of legal battles to get to the point for the family, but finally, at long last, McAfee was found liable for the murder of Greg Fowl. A federal court in Florida ordered him to pay $25 million in damages, but yet again, McAfee plays this, I have no money card. One source reads, I have not responded to a single one of my 37 lawsuits in the past 11 years. McAfee said in his formal response to the media who will spam my phones and who are responsible for most of my 200 plus lawsuits issued shortly after the judgment was announced. They have all been frivolous, even though judges are required to decide for the plaintiff if I do not respond. I refuse to play the legal extortion game aimed at America's wealthy class. 
McAfee argued in his response issued on his Twitter page that over 200 million in judgments have been handed down against him in those 11 years, but that he has no assets and is unable to pay a single penny to any of them, and it is truly mute point. The report states that in a 14-page memorandum opinion and order issued March 19th, U.S. District Court Judge Gregory A. Presnell of U.S. District Court Florida Middle District Orlando Division handed down the judgment that included $20 million in punitive damages. The judgment stemmed from the wrongful death case brought by the family of Gregory Fall, a retired general contractor and restaurateur who had temporarily relocated to Belize from Florida when he was allegedly murdered execution style at McAfee's direction, according to the opinion. A legal extortion of the wealthy class, like you have been found criminally liable for someone's death and he's going to call this extortion. My blood is absolutely boiling. The just the way you can tell the ultra wealthy in this country are so incredibly out of touch with reality is incredible. And it is perfectly clear in this example. But as much as I am infuriated, I also shouldn't be too surprised. McAfee thinks he's above the law and he's been acting this way for years and there's a clear pattern of that too. Hell, he still is. He ran to Belize to escape the lawsuit with the crash of 2006. Then he fled Belize to escape the death of Greg Fowl. Now what? Who's he going to hurt next? In 2019, he and his wife were arrested in the Dominican Republic for heading to an island in a literal boatload of firearms. He was in Norway, he claims, in August 2020, wearing a thong for a face mask, and then he accused them of beating him when he posted to Twitter with a black eye. Yet the guy doesn't even know what fucking country he's in because the police officer in the photo is German. He was indicted for tax evasion, big surprise I'm sure, in October, 2020. And that same month, the SEC or Securities and Exchange Commission filed a complaint against him too. The Justice Department themselves has an entire page about his tax evasion on their site. And here's what it says. According to the indictment, John McAfee earned millions in income from promoting cryptocurrencies, consulting work, speaking engagements, and selling the rights to his life story for a documentary. From 2014 to 2018, McAfee allegedly failed to file tax returns despite receiving considerable income from these sources. The indictment does not allege that during these years, McAfee received any income or had any connection with the antivirus company bearing his name. According to the indictment, McAfee allegedly evaded his tax liability by directing his income to be paid into bank accounts and cryptocurrency exchange accounts in the names of nominees. The indictment further alleges McAfee attempted to evade the IRS by concealing assets, including real property, a vehicle, and a yacht in the names of others. If convicted, McAfee faces a maximum sentence of five years in prison on each count of tax evasion and a maximum sentence of one year in prison on each count of willful failure to file a tax return. McAfee also faces a period of supervised release, restitution, and monetary penalties. This guy needs to go to jail for so, so many reasons. I know I've just kind of whizzed by these last few incidents, but honestly, I I don't care about his young wife, his tax fraud, any of it. I don't care if people enjoy the documentary or not, or if John is going to argue that they're all being paid off by Belize's government. Because once you get down to the very bare bones of who John is, there's one point that matters the most. A court of law deemed him guilty of being responsible for two deaths, Robert Gilson and Gregory Fall. And I believe it says a lot about McAfee's character when he refuses to give these grieving families a dime and minimizes the court's decision to extort him, as he says. Now, this is where the original portion of this script ended, but as per usual and unsurprisingly, I hold on to these scripts until there's usually an update because I like conclusive stories when I decide to share them. That's also the reason why I tend not to cover things when they are like the hot topic of news. I tend to wait until the dust has settled and all the facts and evidence can be collected. Sometimes I'm a little spot on the money, but usually I'm a couple months behind because I like to see what happens in its entirety. And sure enough, my delaying recording the script and waiting turned out to create that moment. So in this update, John McAfee has died in prison on June 23rd, 2021 near Barcelona, Spain, shortly after the Spanish court ordered he be extradited to the United States on tax evasion charges. The Wall Street Journal states, A Spanish court on Tuesday ordered the extradition of Mr. McAfee, 75 years old, in connection with a federal criminal proceeding in Tennessee. Mr. McAfee had been detained in the country since October in connection with criminal charges filed in Tennessee by the Justice Department's tax division. 
The Manhattan U.S. Attorney's Office also sought the extradition of Mr. McAfee in a separate criminal case. John was and always will be remembered as a fighter, said Nishay K. Sanon, an attorney representing Mr. McAfee in U.S. criminal proceedings. He tried to love this country, but the U.S. government made his existence impossible. Personally, after everything I've seen from his criminal acts to his tweets telling people not to get the coronavirus vaccine, I have an incredibly low opinion of John. And no, I don't see him as a fighter and I don't think he deserves to be remembered as such. I don't know how anyone can call him a fighter when as Reuters reports, John took his own life, seemingly to avoid being held accountable for his own actions. I'm not going to rejoice that he's dead, nor the way in which he died, but I'm not sad that he's gone either. Of course, more information has also come out about his pump and dump scheme where he and his bodyguard have allegedly inflated uh, altcoins and reaped more than $13 million in those schemes. There's also many conspiracies swirling around about him that he was killed and didn't take his own life as he claimed he would never take his own life in the past. And a massive Q posted to his Instagram after his death has led others to believe he knew something about the QAnon movement. The Daily Beast also wrote about these claims and stated, McAfee himself appeared to take action some time ago to ensure future reports of his death would be questioned. The same month as his Epstein post to Instagram, he got a tattoo of the word dollar sign whacked. He wrote on Twitter, getting subtle messages from US officials saying, in effect, we're coming for you, McAfee. We're going to kill yourself. I got a tattoo today just in case. If I suicide myself, I didn't. I was whacked. Check my right arm. He had recently launched a cryptocurrency of the same name that advertised itself with an image of Hillary Clinton eating pizza, a none too subtle nod to Pizzagate conspiracy theories. I don't really wanna feed into these conspiracies though. Overall, there's just a lot of fraud, a lot of potentially hidden money, and a lot of unanswered questions. Whether it's cryptocurrency, virus software, or his actions in other countries, I feel he's been shady in every country, deal, or action he's taken part of for decades. And so with all of that being said, that's where I'm going to end today's episode of The Corporate Casket. I hope, well, I mean, I don't know. How can you enjoy something like this? It, It was one hell of a ride, so. Um, For those of you here at the end, I'm glad you buckled in and made it all the way here. It was absolutely one hell of a tale of John McAfee. So if you want to learn or hear about more of these types of stories and dealings, make sure that you're liking, following, and subscribing so that you can stay up to date on all of the latest episodes. I wanna thank you all for making it. I hope you have a fantastic Friday and I'll see you next week.